We're going to start learning the theory of biology by the bare basics of ecology. Let's start by understanding what ecology is. Ecology is the study of the interaction between organisms, and it stems from two words, the Greek word eco for homestead, and ology, meaning the study of. Ecology is focused on two main parts, biotic factors, which are living things, how they interact with other biotic factors, and how they interact with abiotic factors, which are non-living Ecology stems into many sciences, combining different fields of science such as mathematics, chemistry, physics, and much more. We're going to focus on much more of the biological aspects, and we'll take the quantitative biology way later on, not this year. We'll start by the general ideas. There is the biosphere, which includes everything on this earth that's living. And it can be broken down into two forms. Bio, which stems from life, just like in biology, study of living things. Biometric, which is the statistics of living things. And there is sphere, which is just the shape of a ball. Living things are affected by one, other living things, and non-living things. As you can see, there are many examples. But we only need to understand the main difference. A, a living thing, you already know any organism, and how it affects another organism's either survival, reproduction, or distribution. We'll focus on that later on. And abiotic factors can do the same, but they're non-living. Now let's focus on the big picture here. Ecology will never look at a one-to-one -one interaction. It's always about the interactions between the entire ecosystem, not just individuals here. There are seven levels of organization in ecology, but we're only going to take six of them because we're not going down to the cellular level. We start from the individual, and a group of individuals forms a population. A group of different populations interacting with each other form the community. And the community takes place in an ecosystem. Community only consists of the living things, while the ecosystem is the community and how it interacts with the non-living parts of its region. And then a group of similar ecosystems, no matter how far apart, as long as they have the same general conditions, such as temperature, such as their community and such, is a biome. We'll go into in depth later on in chapter 3.1 3.2. And the biosphere, which is all the rhymes on Earth. We start with population. Populations are just a group of individuals or organisms that are able to breed together and live together. For example, you can take a herd of bison, a school of fish, and populations affect each other. If you put a school of fish with a limited amount of food, they will compete for the amount of food there, and they will have less number. If you put a herd of bison into a wide grassland, they will have plentiful amount of resources, and they will grow rapidly. The way individuals work together is with their community, because an individual, while it may not interact much within its own populations, populations will interact with each other. And the population can greatly affect another population and can even be considered a factor to one population. For example, if I take out the population of tigers, the deer population will thrive more. And that's how a major change to another population. A small change to a population would be if I decrease, uh, if I remove deer, for example. If I decrease the number of deer, the tigers may not have enough deer to eat, but they will prey on other animals, so it won't affect them much, but it will still affect them. Those are the biotic interactions. Now let's look at the interaction of biotic and non-abiotic, and non-biotic, such as fish interacting with the water salinity. Water salinity could be considered an abiotic factor for fish, because if you put 
our non-saline water fish into a saline water, so saline here standing for salt water, the fish will be unable to survive. An example of this would be taking a fish, for example, from its home biome and moving it to the ocean biome. The fish will no longer be able to survive, and that's how our, an abiotic factor could affect it. Another thing, if an abiotic factor could help it, for example, if the amount of sunlight increases, that will help plants gain more energy and they will have more growth. An example of how an organism may interact with the ecosystem without its ecosystem defining it is this turtle right here. This turtle dug a burrow to decide for it to be its home or habitat in ecological terms. An example of an ecosystem interaction would be a fungus. A fungus has a niche, which is its role in the ecosystem of being a decomposer. It will break down dead bodies into nutrients which plants could later use on. But a fungus has requirements. It has requirements for it to be able to survive, which are listed in front of you. For example, a fungus cannot live in a very bright area. A fungus to do its job will also need dead resources. And a fungus will need other biotic factors, such as animals which have large corpses to be able to decompose. More in organisms' roles, while two species may have very similar habitats, that does not mean they have the same niche. A bird could live in the same, in the same tree as a squirrel, but a bird will be a pollinator, where a squirrel might spread around seeds rather than pollinating. And it is very important for a species to occupy a niche, because if it does not occupy a niche, it will be unable to survive in the ecosystem as it does not output anything, therefore to break the cycle. And that is how ecosystem envisions happen. If you bring a group of goldfish and send them into a river stream where they do not belong, they would ruin the ecosystem because they have no niche there, they have no job. So they will take from the ecosystem resources without outputting something back, eventually breaking the cycle and we could lead into succession later on explained in lesson 3.1. Another beneficial thing about niches is if an organism has a niche, it will not have to compete with other organisms. A fungus does not need to, com to compete with a lion. Its food is dead things which the lion cannot eat. Therefore, by having a niche, it is, its chances of survival are much higher. So now we're going to explain the point of competition mentioned previously. Competition, to be specific, is when two organisms want the same exact thing, and it is limited. For example, lions eat meat, but so do hyenas. Therefore, they might compete for prey, but hyenas choose to eat the meat left over by the lion's messy eating habits, so they do not have to compete. An animal that would compete with a lion if in the same environment would be a tiger, because both of them would hunt the same prey. Or elephants and rhinos. An elephant might compete for the water with the rhino. That is why they could fight sometimes. Even There can even be competition within the same species. Two elephants might compete for the same water source if it is limited, which might end in either a fight for resources or the sharing of resources because they are the same species. And that's why we break it down into two kinds of competition. And a specific competition, which is between two different species, such as the lion or and tiger example, where there's always a losing part, the side that is weaker, and intraspecific competition, which is competition between the same species, such as the elephants. Now, in this example, there is, the results are not always certain. For one, there could be a loser and winner, and in other chances, which is most of the time, there is a sharing of resources because they are the same species having the same goal. An example of interspecific competition is warbler birds. There are three kinds of the warbler birds who live in the same tree, but each one feeds on a different source of food, therefore they are dividing the resources among each other not to disturb each other. Because after all, they are the same species and they can breed together so a species, a 
في شيء ذا هول والبنفيت Another example of intraspecific competition is two species of paramecium. The two species of paramecium, when introduced into separate agar plates, both of them are capable of thriving. While introduced into the same agar plate, they will compete for resources, and eventually paramecium aurelia beats paramecial codatum, leading to its extinction. And we can break down the community into herbivores and carnivores. But we will not look that in, in depth once again, we'll leave it for the next lesson. For now, we're going to look at how they interact in the ecosystem together. Let's look at keystone species. What makes a keystone species? A keystone species is a species that is necessary to the ecosystem's continued survival. If you take out the keystone species, the ecosystem will collapse. Therefore, it is one of the most important species there because it upholds the entire ecosystem by its existence. Not necessarily being a producer or a carnivore, it does not matter. As long as it is crucial to the ecosystem's existence, then it is a keystone species. I take a simple ecosystem, lions, deers, and grass. If we take out the lion, the deer will the deer shall grow more, but the ecosystem will stay stable. There will be no collapse. Therefore, lions are not a keystone species. If we take a deer, the grass will overpopulate and the lions will die out. Therefore, the ecosystem will head towards collapse and deer are a keystone species. If we take out the grass, the deer will proceed to die and then because the deer die, the lions will die too. Therefore, grass is a keystone species. Another example would be sea otters. When sea otters are there, kelp can grow in a healthy manner and sea urchins because it eats both. If we remove sea otters, sea urchins will grow too much and will eventually ruin the kelp. Therefore, the ecosystem will be led to collapse, which is why sea otters are a keystone species because they can maintain the balance. There are exceptions. For example, as we have talked about predation, there are two examples of things which would be considered not non-predators, but are predators. And the only two you are responsible for would be the Venus flytrap. It is a predatory plant capable of feeding on insects using a sugary mucus and then digesting their enzymes. While it may not completely eat their bodies like a carnivore would, it will suck out their nutrients and then drop them dead, their empty shell. Another example is the praying man mantis and ladybugs. Both of them are insects that prey on other insects, making them predators of their own level. And they can be used in insect as insecticides in gardens or farming. Now, to organize all the information we just took, we took competition, species competing for the same resource at the same time, we took predation, where one species hunts another, and we are about to take symbiotic relations. Symbiotic relationships is a long-term relationship that is between two organisms or more. And there are four types we are responsible for taking, one which is a subtype. There is commensalism, mutualism, parasitism, and brute parasitism, which is a special form of parasitism. Commensalism. Commensalism is a relationship between two or more species where one species benefits but the other species is not harmed at all. For example, you could take lichens and trees. While a lichen may grow on the tree's branches, the lichen will not affect the tree. Clownfish may live in sea anemones but they do not hurt the sea anemone while they get free shelter and cover. Another thing about commensalism, we can take cattle. Cattle just go around staring and gazing on the fields, while the agrid bird will fall around the cattle and take the bugs that are uncovered by the cattle's staring habit. Cattle does not care about this relationship and is not affected, while the agrid bird benefits. Orchids are very much like uh, very much like lichens. They grow on trees which gives them both a home moisture and they're safe. Well, the tree does not care because the orchid does not damage the tree in any way. 
it just coexists to this. Now on to mutualism, which is the second type we have. Mutualism is a relationship where both species benefit. You could consider it where fungi and algae form light chains, which is a combination of both species, where fungi provides algae with moisture and the place to live, and algae provides fungus with beneficial food and nutrients. And you could also take the example shown here of a pollinator. Here we have a moth. The moth it will feed on the plant's sugar and nectar while taking the plant's pollen. And then it will go to another plant, benefiting of its sugar and nectar while dropping its pollen there and taking that plant's pollen to another plant. Therefore, the plant benefits because the moth will spread around its pollen, while the moth benefits because it has its meal, it has nectar. And a very, very special example would be the example between ants, caterpillars, and the acacia plant. The ants use the caterpillars over there for food. The caterpillar will feed on the plant, which does not harm the plant much, while the ant will protect the caterpillar and take the sugar nectar produced by the caterpillar after it feeds on the plant. Therefore, the ant is protecting both the plant from other pests because, because it is protecting the caterpillar on the plant. While the plant benefits because it has protection, the caterpillar has protection, and the ants get food. Therefore, all three species here are benefiting, and all three are helping each other. Here we can see an example of an ant protecting aphids, which is a two-way relationship where aphids suck the plant, which is harmful to the plant, but that's not the relationship we are taking. We're taking the relationship between the ants and the aphids. The ants will protect the aphids, and they will harvest the aphid sugary leftovers, while the aphids will feed off the plants and be safe from other predatory bugs, because the ants will fight for them. Now on to our third relationship, parasitism. Parasitism can be broken down into two examples. external and internal parasitism. External parasitism is where the parasite does not enter the, uh, the host body. But the parasite completely benefits of the host externally while it harms the host. So the parasite here, let's take a tick and the dog. The parasite will feed off the dog's blood, hurting the dog, potentially transferring disease to the dog while it benefits. So it takes away from the dog. Another, and an important example of this is the brute parasitism subtype, which is the brown-headed cowbird and another species of bird, which should not be mentioned because they have multiple species of bird. The way the brown-headed cowbird does it is it lays its eggs in the other bird's nest, and its eggs look very similar to the other bird's eggs. Therefore, the eggs hatch there, and then the young, when they're young, they look to the other bird's young, and then they kick them out. Therefore, it is harming the other bird's young by kicking out its children, and taking away food, which could be used for the other bird's children, while it benefits because it does not have to tend to its young, and its young get free growth because other birds protect their young. Away from that example is internal parasitism. You might have encountered this type yourself, where you had a bacterial infection. But that's not considered a full-term parasitism because it's not a long-term relationship. But a long-term relationship of parasitism I hope you never encounter is a tapeworm or a roundworm. Both tapeworm roundworms are capable of going inside a human's gastrointestinal tract and they can stay there for years upon end, feeding and feeding until they hurt the human being. They take away resources that you eat. So let's say, la samaha Allah, you had a tapeworm inside you. The food that you would eat after it would be digested and it goes through your gastrointestinal tract to be processed, it would take away that resource, in turn harming you because it takes away your resources and taking space in your bodies, which might hurt your organs, specifically your tract and organs surrounding it. Another example with tapeworms is tapeworms growing inside of animals, such as a turtle here. A tapeworm could enter 
the turtle as an egg and then grow out and eventually leave the turtle through its secondary tract which would damage that tract and damage the turtle's feeding habits because it will never get any of the nutrients it eats. A tapeworm will completely take all nutrients from within the turtle. Another example would be a bacterial colony. Bacteria is capable of living inside whatever you name it, organism's body, and they will start a small colony inside, growing, potentially not reaching enough to be an infection or be recognized by the immune system, but they will grow inside and they will take away from the host resources and potentially harm them all for their own growth. We have two examples here and both of them are in humans. One a ringworm, which is a worm that will, could enter your skin via a swamp or any dirty water and it will penetrate your skin and it will start growing on the inside of your skin. And the other example is thick, that, could, that is infected by contact. So if, you, if your hair is in contact with someone who has ticks, the ticks might swap between, so. And ticks suck out blood from your head and cause major itching and pain. While they themselves, they feed off that blood and grow. Therefore, they're harming you for their own benefits, which is why it's an example of parasitism. To recap everything we've taken so far, we've taken ecology, which is the study of living things. We've taken the six major classifications, starting with an individual, then a population, then a community, and then an ecosystem, then the biosphere, a biome, then the biosphere. We've taken the three main things in an ecosystem, which is competition, predation, and symbiotic relationships. And we've taken the three main types of symbiotic relationships, which is commensalism, mutualism, and parasitism. And we've taken the subtype of parasitism known as brood parasitism. Brood, which brood here means related to young or offspring or reproduction. And that is lesson 2.1 in a nutshell, everyone. That'll be it for lesson 2.1, Principles of Ecology. If you have any questions or want to ask anything at all, you can ask it down in the comments or in the server. If you want more tutorials like these, you can find them on the channel or you can look for any other subjects, and that'll be it. Enjoy them.